The first female American astronaut didn't fly until 1983, but back in the early 60s, there was a group of women who proved that they too had the right stuff. Here are five forgotten things about the Mercury 13. Number one, they were all experienced pilots. Dr. Randy Lovelace, who helped to develop the physical tests used by NASA to evaluate male astronaut candidates, believed that women were just as capable of flying in space as men. So while NASA was conducting trials to select the first group of astronauts, who would eventually become known as the legendary Mercury 7, Lovelace invited a woman named Jerry Cobb, a licensed pilot from the age of 17 who had set numerous records for altitude, speed, and distance to undergo the same tests. And Jerry Cobb passed all three phases of the astronaut tests. Following that success, Lovelace selected 19 more women, all experienced pilots with at least a thousand hours of flight time. And number two, they passed the same tests designed for male astronauts. Well, 13 of them did, counting Jerry Cobb, hence the name of the Mercury 13. These women passed all of the same phase one physical tests as NASA astronauts. And these tests ranged from a standard physical to induced vertigo, electrical shocks, and endurance tests on specially designed weighted stationary bikes. Not only did these women pass all of the same phase one physical trials as the male astronauts, number three, they did as well as or better than the male astronauts. The 13 women who passed phase one testing represented a higher success rate than NASA had observed among its male astronaut candidates. Dr. Lovelace came to believe that women might be better suited to space travel than men because they are smaller on average and less prone to heart attacks. They also seemed better able to deal with the isolation of solo space flight. Three of the women, Jerry Cobb, Rhea Hurl, and Wally Funk, were subjected to phase two testing, including sensory deprivation tests, where they lasted over nine hours. It had been previously assumed that the upper limit for tolerating a sensory deprivation test was six hours. John Glenn only lasted three hours. Cobb, Hurl, and Funk were preparing to continue their testing, but number four, they were thwarted by sex discrimination. The three members of the Mercury 13 who reached phase two were scheduled to undergo further testing at a US Navy facility in Pensacola, Florida. Those tests were canceled when the Navy declined to allow its facilities to be used for testing that had not been officially requested by NASA. Because astronauts all had to be certified test pilots, and women were barred from the military's test pilot training programs, the U.S. manned space program was just that, something in which only a man could participate. But the women of the Mercury 13 did not let that stop them. Number five, they stood up for women's equality in the space program. Jerry Cobb and her fellow Mercury 13 member Janie Hart appealed to President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson to be allowed to continue their astronaut testing. In July 1962, they testified before Congress, but unfortunately were unsuccessful in convincing the lawmakers to see things their way. And it was another 21 years before the first American woman, Sally Ride, flew in space. Nonetheless, the Mercury 13 proved that women were just as capable of becoming astronauts as men. Jerry Cobb continued to fly. She earned international praise for her humanitarian work. And in 1981, she was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. She never became an astronaut, but her and the rest of the Mercury 13 earned their place in history by pointing the way to a more equal and inclusive future. The hardest part is picking only five. Catch you next time. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please like, share, and subscribe. And also please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash steveshives to become a patron. Thanks for watching.